This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, food waste. It costs more than most people think. We all too often see people looking at the date and throwing out food unnecessarily. When they do that, they're not only throwing out the food, but they're throwing money right down the trash. How food waste hurts when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. This week on Viewpoints. She ultimately pays for that work that she did, the immense risks that she took. She pays for those risks with her life, basically. The stories of female journalists reporting in the Arab world. Then, thing in your hand could end up in the environment for hundreds of years. You literally used it for about three seconds. It's almost 2020. It's time to stop using as much plastic. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station and subscribe and listen to shows anytime on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. If you're expecting a dozen people for your upcoming Labor Day cookout, you'll buy plenty of food to be sure you don't run out. But if the weather's bad, maybe only eight or nine people show up. And then how on earth can you eat that much leftover potato salad? Sooner or later, it spoils and gets thrown out. The sad story of a lot of food. NRDC estimates that up to 40% of the food supply in the United States goes to waste every year. It's a huge number that has all sorts of economic and social and environmental consequences. That's Joanne Birkenkamp, senior advocate for the Natural Resources Defense Council. The economic impact of that food that's going to waste is about $218 billion. So it's a very large number that affects farms and restaurants and food service companies and grocery stores and particularly consumers. And it has a lot of environmental consequences as well. Because when we waste food, we not only waste the food itself, but all of the environmental resources, the energy, the water, the pesticides and so forth, packaging that were taken to produce that food. NRDC has exhaustively evaluated U.S. food output and what we import. They've come up with a detailed report on where it goes and how consumers, restaurants, distributors, and everyone else could do a better job of cutting down the waste. In the United States, Nearly all of the food that is produced but not consumed and is discarded through municipal solid waste is either being landfilled or incinerated. And that's a big problem because our landfills are filling up. And once material like food is put into a landfill, it generates and releases methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Overflowing landfills have long been a problem for big cities and one that people seem to connect with readily. But Birkenkamp says the methane part of the environmental impact is getting recognition now as well. The greenhouse gas emissions associated with food waste just in the United States are equivalent to the emissions of 37 million passenger vehicles each year. If food waste globally were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions after China and the United States. And that's just the food that we waste. It's not all of agricultural production. It's just the food that is produced and goes uneaten. So food waste is an enormous issue from a climate change perspective. It's also a major user of things like water. About 20% of the water that's used for agriculture in the United States is used to grow food that we don't eat. Similarly, there are a lot of pesticides, fertilizers, other agricultural inputs that are utilized and essentially go to waste because the food itself is going to waste. There are a lot of ways that food is wasted and a lot of places where it happens, but the number one source may not be what you think. And I often hear people suggest that maybe grocery stores are the problem, but the truth of it is in the United States, it's been estimated that about 43 percent of all the waste that occurs actually occurs in our home. It's really about consumers, us as individuals and as families, growing out food that we purchase. And so you see a lot of reasons for that. Often we go to the grocery store and we don't have a list. Maybe we're hungry, maybe we're engaging in impulse purchases. 
very large tax sizes can encourage people to purchase more than they actually need. We may not be thinking about how much cooking we're actually going to do. We get to the grocery store and we tend to be aspirational shoppers. We want to make sure we get everything we need. We want variety. We want to buy healthy options. But when we get home, sometimes we end up going out for dinner instead of cooking. We just don't have the time that we anticipated. So often we're purchasing more than we can use. Birkenkamp says many of us are also confused about how we need to store foods to maximize their shelf life. Things may end up on the counter that belong in the refrigerator. We often keep things in the fridge too long and don't eat them, but could have put them in our freezer so that they're there and ready for us when we need it. Dairy is another one. That's an area where consumers can be helpful in the sense that if you put your milk bottle on the door of your refrigerator, every time you open the door, it's letting in a little bit of hot air, and that can reduce the shelf life of your milk. If you take the milk out and put it on your dinner table and it's out at room temperature for an hour, for instance, several days in a row, that's going to reduce the shelf life. Storing milk deep inside the fridge rather than in the door is a simple way for almost all of us to cut food waste. But Birkenkamp says dairy isn't the kind of food that we waste most. At home and society-wide, fruits and vegetables tend to be the thing that are wasted the most. And clearly they're perishable. It's important to know how to store them correctly to maximize their shelf life. And that's an area where consumers can really be helpful purchasing what they need, storing it correctly, using it promptly, and then freezing it if they're not able to use it as soon as they expected. So fruits and vegetables are a real area for concern and also for innovation. Birkenkamp says one other food waste factor among consumers is rampant confusion about what sell-by, use-by, or best-by dates mean on food packaging. There are a number of really critical myths around food date labels, including the idea that they're federally regulated, In fact, other than infant formula, food date labels are not federally regulated. They're determined by the companies that produce the food. Secondly, another important myth is that people often assume that the food date label is an indicator of safety and that after the date on the food, it's unsafe and should be thrown out. And in fact, in most cases, that's not the truth. Most of the time, food vendors will put food date labels on their products as an indicator of freshness. And when the food is at its peak freshness, it's not an indication of safety. So we all too often see people looking at the date and throwing out food unnecessarily. When they do that, they're not only throwing out the food, but they're throwing money right down the trash when they don't need to. On top of the roughly 40% of food waste that's generated in the home, Birkenkamp says another 30% comes from food service operations. So that would include places like restaurants or college cafeterias or hotels or catered events. So food service is the next biggest factor after consumers at home. So when we look at the losses in a food service environment, it's very important that businesses think about how to donate surplus food that they may have in their kitchens, food that has not been served to people but was prepared. For instance, if they're preparing too much or the weather is bad and not as many people come to their restaurant as expected, they may have extras. So when they have appropriate surpluses, it's really important that businesses donate that food to people in need. In the United States, there are now about 40 million people who are considered food insecure and who may not know where their next meal is going to come from. So it's very important in those situations that businesses and universities and hotels and hospitals make sure that those surplus foods reach people in need. We're doing a lot better at that getting food to the food insecure, but not that much of it yet is coming from food service operations. There are about 4 billion meals being donated by various types of businesses each year, and that's an impressive number. Most of it is coming from either food manufacturers or grocery stores. That effort started way back in the 1970s, and it's quite well developed. There are food banks all over the country that are part of that process, as well as a growing body of smaller organizations who help connect surplus food with people right locally in their community. But there's room for expansion. NRDC has done a lot of work modeling the potential to expand food donation. And what we've found is in places like Denver, Colorado or Nashville, Tennessee, those communities could meet up to 50% more of their meal gap 
if they optimize food donation. So what holds up some businesses from doing more? Why are they slow to divert potentially wasted food to organizations that feed the hungry? Businesses often are unaware that they are protected under federal law from liability associated with donated food. The United States is very fortunate to have federal law that's been on the books since 1996 that gives very comprehensive liability protection to food donors. And that's important to them. They want to make sure that food is donated, that the people who receive it have a good experience, and that the organizations in the middle of that chain are handling it safely. So we need to do more to make sure that businesses understand the liability protections that are already in place. We also need to do more to communicate about the tax breaks that are incentives for businesses to donate. One example of the groups bridging food producers with nonprofits feeding the hungry is Food Forward in Los Angeles. We are a produce recovery agency, so we take fruits and vegetables that would have otherwise gone to waste and redistribute them through a network of receiving agencies that we work with here in Southern California. That's Michelle Chase, Agency Relations Field Coordinator for Food Forward. Our founding program is our Backyard Harvest Program. Our founder, Rick Nemias, was just identified that there was this huge amount of residential property produce that no one was necessarily recovering to the best of its ability. You know, homeowners have trees and they might pick a couple of oranges from time to time, but meanwhile, there's hundreds of pounds of fruit on those trees that might not be getting harvested. So he decided to get a local crew together in his neighborhood and harvest some produce. I think they collected 800 pounds on their first harvest. And that has now grown into his company and only one arm of our programming. Food Forward now also works with institutional orchards as well as those in backyards. At farmers markets, they recover unsold produce at the end of the day. And now they're collecting unsold produce from wholesalers as well. And it totals more than 100,000 pounds of produce per day that otherwise would have probably gone to a landfill. Food recovery groups are also finding that city governments are interested in helping out, and Birkenkamp says they're in a good place to do it. Cities are often in charge of municipal solid waste management. They're managing the trucks or paying for the trucks, and they're managing the contract for haulers to pick up food waste in their community. They're often looking at their landfills and realizing that they don't have an infinite amount of space. They need to be making sure that all sorts of materials are being recycled or reused rather than going to landfill. And cities are also concerned about food insecurity in their communities. There's not a city in the United States that doesn't have people who are in need of additional food assistance. So cities are often very receptive and focused on how to keep appropriate foods from going to waste, from making sure that that food reaches people in need as well as preventing food surpluses from happening in the first place, and then ensuring that remaining food scraps are recycled rather than going to landfill. Birkenkamp says there's a great deal of innovation going on to divert food waste. Smartphone apps connect organizations that may have surplus food at the last minute to those that need it. And in some cities, cafes specializing in serving recovered food are also springing up. With a little thought and effort, it's turning into a win-win for everyone. You can find out more about the NRDC's efforts at savethefood.com. You can find out about Los Angeles produce recovery efforts at foodforward.org. Or you can find out about all of our guests through links on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. I'm Reed Pence. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call this toll-free number right now, 800-279-0419. That's 800-279-0419. By calling your addiction team, you're taking the first steps to recovery. Don't fight addiction alone. Their advisors are ready to take your call. Your future is still a bright place. The help you need could be one call away. 800-279-0419. That's 800-279-0419. This call is completely confidential. And if you have private insurance, there could be little to no cost to you. Even if you've already been to treatment, give us a call. There's no need to let addiction ruin your life. 
Take the first step now. Call your addiction team at 800-279-0419. That's 800-279-0419. Make the free call now. 800-279-0419. Your addiction team is a third-party advertiser for various treatment centers and placement networks. Individual results will vary. Visit youraddictionteam.com slash terms for more information. This message is sponsored by GSK. Is your teen vaccinated? Meningitis B is an uncommon but potentially life-threatening illness. If your teen is starting college, make sure you talk to their doctor about how vaccination can help protect them against meningitis B. Only 14.5% of teens have been vaccinated against meningitis B. GSK spokesperson Tiffany Williams. My younger brother was at his dream college when he contracted meningitis B. His doctors thought it was the flu and told him to rest. Two days later, he passed away. I can't bring my brother back. But with this message, I hope to educate others to help protect themselves. Early symptoms of meningitis may appear similar to those of the flu, but can progress quickly and be fatal, sometimes within 24 hours. One in 10 people infected with meningitis will die. One in five survivors will suffer long-term consequences, such as loss of limbs. GSK Vaccine's U.S. Vice President, Director of Scientific Affairs and Public Health, Dr. Len Friedland. Adolescents have higher rates of meningitis due to close contact with each other, sharing drinks or utensils, kissing or coughing. Talk to their doctor about the two different types of meningitis vaccines needed to help protect them against the five vaccine-preventable groups of meningitis. Vaccination may not protect all recipients. Learn more at meningitisb.com. Again, that's meningitisb, M-E-N-I-N-G-I-T-I-S-B.com. Trying to sell your old car? Instead, donate your vehicle to Heritage for the Blind. Pickup is free and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-835-1478. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats, whether they run or not. Donate your vehicle and you'll receive a free three-day vacation voucher to over 50 locations. Call 1-800-835-1478. That's 1-800-835-1478. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTrax Communications. If you enjoyed this broadcast, please support our show by subscribing, sharing it with a friend, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and RadioHealthJournal.net. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. Why did Julian pass away? That's the number one question I have, right? Because we don't have an answer yet. More than 400 children are mysteriously dying every year, and we don't know why. Then tonsil stones, a little problem that causes a big stink. I just operated on a 46-year-old for tonsil stones, so they can come at any time. All that and more coming up next week on Radio Health Journal.